Pastor Justina is busy being the family pastor. She's handing out boxes for our children's program for the month of September. Uh, if you have anyone in your life who needs to pick up their box, we're going to have it available this morning till 1130 and then we'll be in the office throughout the week during our regular office hours when those boxes can be picked up. We are launching a new initiative in the church, and that is small groups. We are trying to get small groups going throughout the church, and it is our dream that everyone in the church would be in a small group because we believe that they're so important to the life of our church and not to you know, speak this into existence or you know, predict the future, but if we have to go into another lockdown, we really believe that life groups and small groups are going to be truly important to maintaining the community that we have here. So we're especially right now looking for hosts. And if you receive our weekly Elam Chapel newsletter, you'll have seen that in there. And there's a link where you can sign up if that's something that you're interested in doing, if you're interested in opening your home or even just hosting a Zoom call where we can all be together. That's something that we need you for. Starting next week, we're going to 45-minute services. We're going to extend a little bit more. We're going to have a little bit more time to worship together, a little bit more time to hear from the Word, and uh, we're just going to work on getting a little bit closer back to normal. So I'm excited about that. I don't know about you guys. Maybe you're enjoying the short service. Maybe you're enjoying hearing a little less from me. But So next week, 45-minute services. And today, this is my last announcement. Today, if you're wearing a mask, we've received a new directive You can sing quietly if you're wearing a mask, is the rule. So that's, I think that's pretty exciting. It looks like just about everybody's wearing one, so that's great news. Looks like Kim won't be all by herself today. So please enjoy our service. Let's open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for another week. Thank you for bringing us back together. Thank you for a place where we can gather. Thank you for a province where we are safer from the virus where we haven't had the deaths that some other parts of the world have seen. We pray, Lord, for continued healing and protection for our people. And we pray, Lord, that you would be with us this morning as we gather to praise your name, to lift you up, and to become the people that you're bringing us to be. In your name we pray. Amen. The computer crashed this morning, so Tom hasn't had a chance to go through the words uh, as we were singing in rehearsal. So just Please be patient with him this morning as he's dealing with a lot back there. And we just appreciate so much what they do back there. We don't always uh, see them, um, but what they do is so important to what happens here. I also want to say that I'm very thankful that my husband is sitting at the piano. For those of you who hadn't heard or didn't know, in June, at the end of June, um, he had a bike accident and broke his left elbow. Um, And so um, it's been an amazing thing to see the healing process. Um, And he's doing well. He's not back to 100% normal, but he's able to play piano, which is a a very good thing. Please continue to pray for him as he heals and works on his conducting some more. (coughs) So I want to begin by reading from Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 to 4. It was in the year King Uzziah died that I saw the Lord. He was sitting on a lofty throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Attending him were mighty seraphim, each having six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. They were calling out to each other, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Their voices shook the temple to its foundations, and the entire building was filled with smoke.
brought a towel with me to church today. Actually, I forgot it, and someone had to run and find one here for me to use. I'm not actually expecting to get wet and need it. It is a prop. It's a metaphor for the point of today's Bible story, which is to say that the most profound dignity that humanity can experience is ultimately discovered in acts of humble service. 
The Gospel of John provides some interesting details of a foot washing incident that occurred near the end of Jesus' life. And the underlying message of Jesus' teaching about this on the very night he was betrayed is counterintuitive. It suggests that humble service, humble service is the way to exaltation, that submission is an avenue to overcoming. The way up turns out to be down. In John 13, we read that Jesus and his disciples were gathering to observe the Passover feast. They'd made their way from the dusty roadway into the calm of an upstairs room and were jostling to secure their places for the rituals and the meal yet to come. But something was neglected in the hustle. Cleanliness, good manners, personal hygiene, it was their feet. These feet had been tromping through streets rife with dust and the detritus of urban living, and they needed a wash before they were fed to stretch out around the room. Foot washing, dealing with someone else's toe jam, has never been a glamour job. Normally, a junior servant would bring water, basin, and a towel to welcome the guests, and this servant would rub the grime of the road from weary souls, leaving feet clean and presentable, and I don't know if you've had this experience I've had, but it feels real good to have weary feet washed. It's wholesome. It's uh, healthy. It's refreshing. But on the night that Jesus was betrayed, there was no servant in the room that had been prepared for this eager crew. And this is the crux of the story. It was Jesus who noticed what needed to be done and then went ahead and did it. Think about this for a minute. The leader of the organization took personal responsibility to perform the most menial duty. This is not the trajectory of upward mobility. Jesus took up the towel. And this, if anything, would have been a denigration of his social status. This was Joe Boy stuff, not cool. Now, perhaps a stirring of guilt rippled through their company as their leader served in this humble way. I imagine that it hushed the clet chatter pretty good, and it certainly presented a teaching moment which Jesus took advantage of. I have given you an example, he said, that you also should do as I have done to you. Which begs the question, what exactly did Jesus want? his followers to learn. Now the story is much bigger than I've been able to relate today. It contains much drama and more than a few key lessons. But the key point, I believe, is when Jesus instructs his disciples to do what he just modeled, to wash each other's feet, which is more than mere foot washing. It is an example to attend to each other's needs, to learn from and look to each other in order to keep the griminess of life from stultifying our individual souls. I have given you an example. Go and do likewise. In other words, we are servants to each other. <clears throat> we are, in some senses, to be our brother's keeper. Jesus' teaching further suggests that striving for social status is a vain pursuit. Human beings were not created uh, <clears throat> to pursue self-aggrandizement or to prevail over others. We do need to look after our own needs, of course, but we should also be looking to the well-being of our neighbors, of our communities, of our world attending to each other's physical and spiritual well-being is part and parcel of the Christian calling. Wash each other's feet. 
be prepared to be involved in sacrificial ways to serve the interests of others, be accountable to each other, take up the towel. There is, however, some important caveats. One is that before you indulge in the impetus to attend to the crud in someone else's life, you need to be doing your own work on yourself. Your own feet should be clean before you wash someone else's. The call to Christian accountability isn't a call to be busybodies or meddlers, pointing out faults in others while remaining blind to our own. This kind of spiritual care, washing each other's feet, requires each of us to work at our own soul stuff, to be willing to expose our vulnerabilities, address our weaknesses, and to grow into our strengths. I wash my hands a lot. As a hospital worker, I'm repeatedly lathering my hands with either sanitizer or a good soap and water wash. As a caregiver at home, I'm also continually attending to hand hygiene. As a citizen in a pandemic, these are good habits to have, and I hope you all are experiencing something similar. Foot washing isn't so needed in our culture, yet regular hand washing is a major contributor to community health at any time, in any era. But hand washing for me has become something of a ritual a ritual I don't even think about, really. I first turn on the tap to what I hope will be a warm stream of water. I do a quick rub through to dampen my hands before hitting them with a dab of soap. And I spread that around my hands and onto my wrists and get another little bit of water in there and another shot of soap and try to work it up into a lather. I uh, spread it around my hands onto my wrists and uh, rub the palms, the backs of the hands, the sides, the webbing, back and forth in some sort of juicy squishiness, and then back under for a fulsome, full warm water rinse. And the cleansing actually feels pretty good, purifying and satisfying. And it takes approximately 20 seconds, which can feel like a lifetime when the impetus of my body and my day, my agenda is saying this is an interruption. It's because the truth, washing my hands is often a nuisance, an interruption, an annoyance in the traffic of my day. I try not to think of it that way, if only because there's really not much point for me to resent a simple act of common decency, an act of respect for self and others, and I may grumble and hasten my way through the procedure. Uh, this happens. Or I can choose to savor the moment, to be grateful for a 20-second opportunity to experience cleansing. So what's a good way to make use of these interruptions to the traffic of our day? Think of the possibilities. If my hands are on autopilot, my mind can go anywhere. Why not make it a ritual? Why not take a 20-second break from <clears throat> other demands and turn your mind to a place of peace? This is not indulgent. This is self-care. Why not a 20-second reflection on purifying some aspect of oneself? Uh, something sullied is bound to occur. Why not take a short uh, time to prepare your mind for the task ahead? A pause before re-engaging is rarely a bad thing. What will you do with your 20 seconds? Every moment of every day presents us with opportunities to slide into what's easy or to pursue the common good, which ultimately serves our own self-advantage. I'm often lazy enough to slouch along the lines of least resistance, I need gentle reminders. I need good models. I need to see others washing their hands and doing their own spiritual care work. I need to see others setting their own interests aside to benefit the well-being of others. I need to wash my feet even as I do the necessary work toward the cleansing of my soul. It does me well to ask 
what I might be resenting in any given moment or to wonder how I might see the beauty that is present in every place and every circumstances. Where is the good way? Help me, O oh God, to choose it. As a person who aspires to follow Jesus, I need to be paying attention to these teachings. To die to self is to be born to new life. To serve others is to benefit oneself. To take up the towel is to choose a way of living that endures forever. This teaching is explicitly echoed in a passage from Philippians 2, where it says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him a name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Clean your hands and your heart. Take up the towel. Wash each other's feet. The way up is down. Amen. We want to leave you with a song based on Ephesians chapter 6, which is a call to put on our armor and to go out and to fight for the cause of Christ. So this is a charge for us this morning.
with you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his face unto you and give you peace. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord and each other. Amen. <laughs>